I think there must be something wrong with me, Drake. Avengers Endgame is coming, but I'm not that excited. I don't feel the way I'm supposed to feel. I just don't understand the MCU, I guess. I like these movies, and the characters, and I love the comics, but I'm still not excited. Patrick Willems, of all the people I know, you're the only person who could take a wonderful thing, like $200 million superhero movies, and turn it into a problem. Maybe Chloe's right. Of all the Patrick Willemses in the world, you're the Patrick Willemsist. I still remember how excited I was seeing Spider-Man on opening day in 2002. I dreamed of one day seeing the whole Marvel Universe on screen, with Spider-Man hanging out with Captain America, and Thor visiting the Sanctum Sanctorum. And then I got it, and it was good. But something feels missing. Is it me? Or is it the movies? Good grief. Okay. We've got 10 years and 20 movies to cover, so if we're gonna do this right, then we've gotta go way back. Back to the weird, wild world of the early 2000s, where it all started. The superhero movie boom of the early 2000s was an exciting time for a teenage comic book fan like me. Finally, the comics I had loved my whole life were being turned into movies, and this time, it wasn't stuff like Batman and Robin. Back then, the Marvel characters were all split up at different studios, and there was no real template for how to make these things work. So you'd see things like X-Men, which kept a lot of the essential elements but stripped away anything too comic booky, or Ang Lee's Hulk, which is an incredibly weird art film disguised as a superhero action movie. But Sam Raimi's Spider-Man in 2002 was the real game changer. It didn't need to be gritty or realistic. It didn't need to put Spider-Man in black leather. It did the comic book on screen. The movie was essentially working off of the design of 1978's Superman, with its mix of origin movie structure, colorful action, and a personal story about a relatable hero. What's notable about superhero movies from this time was how loosely they adapted the comic books. Comics are, after all, built on long-form serialized storytelling, and feature films aren't really built for that. Raimi's Spider-Man movies mined the comics for characters and story elements and assembled them into what is very much a cinematic story. The second movie might have a bit of a sequel set up with Harry Osborn, but each film was designed to be its own thing and its own story, without much thought to future installments. Back then, these were just movies. When other movies tried to adapt specific stories from the comics, they ran into trouble. Daredevil from 2003 tries to tell an origin story and fit in the most famous Daredevil storyline from the comics, the Electra Saga. It's literally called a saga. How do you expect to do that justice in just half a movie? X-Men The Last Stand attempted to adapt the most famous X-Men story, the Dark Phoenix Saga, and again, that resulted in it being condensed and stripped down until it barely resembled itself, and it satisfied almost no one. Guys, if the story has the word saga in the title, it's gonna be tough to fit it into two hours or less. So please don't try to turn this into a movie. And then Marvel formed their own studio and made Iron Man. I'm not gonna waste a lot of time recapping phase one of the MCU because we all know how it went. Marvel basically did a bunch of origin movies working off of the same framework as Superman and Spider-Man. If you look at the directors they hired, they weren't going for visionaries. No Christopher Nolans or Ang Lees here. With these movies, they weren't going for home runs, they were going for good, solid doubles. Line drives to center field. Baseball metaphors. While there are some less than amazing aspects of the Phase 1 movies, like the finale of Iron Man 1 is pretty generic, hit the button stuff, Incredible Hulk is relentlessly mediocre, what's the deal with Kenneth Branagh and Dutch Angles? But the essential thing that Marvel got right was the characters. Tony Stark, Steve Rogers, and Thor are so well-defined and so well-acted that they overcame any other flaws the movies have. 
In all of superhero cinema, I'm not sure there's a moment that so perfectly defines a character as the grenade scene in Captain America. By the end of each of those movies, we've seen these characters grow and struggle, and yeah, we're ready to follow them into future films. And while it's better to just ignore Iron Man 2, Marvel, bring back Sam Rockwell, you cowards. In recent years, I've seen a lot of conversation that has seemed to minimize Joss Whedon's contributions to the MCU. It's become a common refrain that the Russo brothers fixed what he messed up. I think that's wrong, but that's just my opinion. But what isn't really up for debate is that other than Kevin Feige and maybe Robert Downey Jr., I don't think there's anyone as essential to the MCU's success as Whedon. Let's run down a list of the things that Whedon accomplished with the Avengers. He pretty much created the movie versions of Black Widow, Hawkeye, and Agent Coulson from scratch. They had appeared in other movies, but other than the inherent charisma of the actors, the characters had no real personalities, backstories, or stories of their own. Bruce Banner was completely overhauled, and when he shows up in Avengers, he might as well be a brand new character. So that's pretty much half the team that Whedon created for the film. And most importantly, he figured out how to put Iron Man, Captain America, and Thor in the same movie and make it work. He figured out their character dynamics, their conflicts, how they work together, and the ways each of them grow over the course of the movie. It is honestly a miracle that this movie works, that it was able to pit Tony Stark against a Norse god summoning an alien invasion in the middle of Manhattan and have it feel right. And that's because it's a movie that perfectly fits the kind of story Whedon has been telling for his whole career, about a group of damaged people with big conflicts and problems coming together to do what's right. So in The Avengers, some of the costumes are goofy and the lighting can be flat and awkward. A lot of the visual storytelling in the first two acts looks like a TV show. But the movie works because the character stuff works. Whedon cracked the formula that has driven the entire MCU for the past seven years. What's more fun than the big action scenes is just watching the characters interact. So let me quote Tom Bryan from the AV Club. He writes, There's a sort of logic to action movies. You tolerate the scenes of dialogue and exposition to get to the fights. The movies of the Marvel Cinematic Universe have inverted that whole dynamic. The action scenes are grand and elaborate and impressive, but they're not what gets anyone in the door. Instead, the bits of Marvel movies that people love, the bits that keep them coming back, are the scenes in between the action. They're the throwaway jokes, the deep breaths, the moments of quiet bonding. The action scenes themselves can be obligatory or stapled on. And there's something essential that I don't see brought up enough. Whedon understands how to shoot superheroes like few other directors. Almost every shot in the Battle of New York is framed like a comic book panel. The action isn't a mishmash of handheld second unit shots. It's composed carefully. It's dynamic and fluid and, for lack of a better term, superheroic. What Whedon gets is that imagery and iconography matters. How these characters are posed, how they move, matters. These are adaptations of a visual media made up of still images, and the power of those individual images can't be ignored. The best comic book movies are full of images that stick with us. I mean, in 30 years, people will still remember this shot. Whedon actually figured out how to do the cinematic equivalent of a double splash page from the comics, with one continuous shot linking all the characters together. So look, Whedon has his problems, and it is deeply weird that he used this gag in two different movies. Sorry. But it's disingenuous, and I think just wrong, to say that he isn't largely responsible for making the MCU work. With the first Avengers movie, Joss Whedon perfected what would become the Marvel formula. And honestly, I'm not sure anyone did it quite as well ever again. I just don't get it. What happened between Phase 1 and Phase 2? I still like those movies, but something feels different about them. Joe cool, back in school. That wasn't helpful at all. There's a concept or an edict laid down by Stan Lee when he was editor-in-chief of Marvel Comics in the 1960s, and that's that they needed to maintain what he called the illusion of change. The idea is that the ongoing stories in the comics should feel like they're full of life-changing events, that anything could happen. 
but that things will always eventually return to the classic status quo. So while Peter Parker might go to college or get new jobs or have new love interests, while supporting cast members might die, while he might grow additional arms or have his mind taken over by Dr. Octopus for a couple years, eventually he will always return to the core concept of Peter Parker, down on his luck, struggling to balance the responsibilities of his superhero life and his regular life. That will never change. But while on a macro level there might appear to be no change over 50 years, on a micro level it feels like there is. Over a single year, a character might experience huge upheaval in their life. When you're reading the story itself, it feels like actual change is happening. With superheroes, the greatest change in their lives tends to be their origin story. They have to change to become a superhero. Whether it's a physical change or psychological change are usually a combination of the two. And then they carry on in superhero mode without ever experiencing another change of the same magnitude. Even if they die, they tend to come back. So Marvel's Phase 1 movies featured real change for those characters. Tony Stark went from a greedy weapons manufacturer to a hero who puts his life on the line to atone for his past sins. Steve Rogers transforms from a weakling to a literal super soldier, loses some of the people closest to him, and sacrifices his own life to save the world. Thor grows beyond his arrogance and puts the safety of Earth above his own desires. And they all learn to work together for the greater good of humanity. So now that these characters are fully formed, how does Marvel continue to tell stories with them that feel like they're growing and changing? Well, that brings us to the Marvel Cinematic Universe Phase 2. Okay, this is going to make some people angry, but whatever. Now, I like Captain America the Winter Soldier. It's fun and exciting, it's got Robert Redford and Gary Shandling as secret Nazis. Like most people, I used to think it was one of the very best MCU films. Until rewatching them all this past week. It's still good, it just fell a bit in my estimation. And my big issue with it is the whole Hydra thing. Hail Hydra. What everyone says about this one is that it's really a 70s conspiracy thriller, that it's a complex story about Steve Rogers figuring out how to function in a modern world with 21st century geopolitics. But it's not. It's pretty simple, actually. S.H.I.E.L.D. turns on him, then he learns they've been taken over by Hydra, his old enemy from World War II, so obviously he takes them down. Don't get me wrong, he's surprised by this, but there's no hard choice for him to make. They're Nazi terrorists. Obviously, he's going to fight them. The movie says it's about Cap struggling to adapt to a complicated modern world, but then it turns out he's actually just fighting the same enemy as before. But the movie sets up a much greater internal conflict for him. When Nick Fury shows him S.H.I.E.L.D.'s big plan with all the helicarriers designed to cut off any potential attack before it happens, he's freaked out by how S.H.I.E.L.D. has turned into something that he's not fully on board with. Like Steve says, This isn't freedom. This is fear. So wouldn't it be more interesting to not have Hydra there at all? Instead of it being as black and white as Captain America vs. Nazis, what if Captain America's moral conflict was with S.H.I.E.L.D. itself? This way he actually has to question his allegiance and make a hard decision with real consequences. And that's where the MCU after Phase 1 has struggled. In those Phase 1 movies, the heroes made hard choices. Tony Stark chose to build that suit in the cave in order to survive. He chose to stop producing weapons. Steve Rogers chose to sacrifice himself to save the world. Thor, with his powers stripped away, chose to still fight the Destroyer to protect Earth, and then chose to destroy the Bifrost to keep it safe. Back then, characters died and their deaths meant something. Dr. Erskine, the one guy who saw Steve Rogers' potential, dies reminding him not to forget who he is. Coulson's death is the event that motivates the Avengers to put aside their conflicts and come together to save the world. Here's the thing. Marvel is amazing at characterization. These movies are packed with great moments that define who these characters are and their relationships with each other. But what Marvel is not amazing at is making those characters grow. Age of Ultron is about Tony Stark in his obsessive need to protect the world, putting an artificial intelligence in a robot body, which has disastrous results. So the solution to this, the thing that saves the day in the end, is to put another artificial intelligence in another robot body. But this time, it works. So much of this movie is dedicated to showing the dangerous results of Tony's hubris, and then it's that hubris that saves them. The movie feels like it's building to some real consequences, some real change, 
but there's nothing. I mean, Quicksilver dies, but Tony barely knows who that guy is. What's odd about this is that Whedon has always understood the importance of growth and consequences. He's one of the only filmmakers to actually kill off characters in MCU movies. And considering what he said about his unpleasant experience working with Marvel on Ultron, and how he left the MCU after it, I can't help but wonder if he wanted a different conclusion, one with some real change. But because Marvel needed the Vision introduced, and a particular Avengers lineup at the end of the movie, he wasn't allowed to. Again, this is only speculation, but it wouldn't surprise me if it's true. And this kind of thing happens in most of these movies. The characters don't face real consequences, and they don't grow. At the end of Spider-Man Homecoming, why does Peter turn down Tony's offer to join the Avengers? What lesson did he learn? That by defeating the criminal father of the girl you like, you shouldn't get a promotion? The movie is telling him, Peter, you were great all along. No need to change. The big scene where Peter lifts the rocks up, his motivation there is to stop the Vulture from stealing Tony's stuff so that he'll get to be an Avenger. And then by stopping the Vulture, he learns that he doesn't want to be. And then in Infinity War, he becomes one anyway. You're an Avenger now. The movies consistently seem to feature big developments that turn out not to be. In Winter Soldier, S.H.I.E.L.D. collapses and Hydra returns. And then in the next movie, Nick Fury is back with a S.H.I.E.L.D. helicarrier and Hydra is finished off in the opening scene. Cap is basically doing exactly what he was with S.H.I.E.L.D., just with the Avengers instead. Now, I'm not a fan of the comic book Civil War, but I appreciate that at the end of it, Cap realizes that he's wrong. He learns something, and he lets himself be arrested, accepting the consequences for his actions. In the movie Civil War, Cap doesn't learn anything. He's a fugitive, but he can hang out with his friends in Wakanda, and even extends an olive branch to Tony. That movie begins by presenting what feels like a real ideological debate about accountability. It wants us to feel kind of guilty about enjoying these big superhero battles. But then the movie forgets about that, the story becomes all about Bucky, and it wants us to have fun watching another big superhero battle. Even the characters themselves acknowledge that they aren't really trying to hurt each other and that there are no stakes. We're still friends, right? Depends on how hard you hit me. The big final showdown between Steve and Tony is beautifully executed. Downey and Evans act the hell out of it. But it's basically just a misunderstanding. Bucky didn't really kill Tony's parents. He was mind controlled. We know that. At the end of the fight, they walk away, neither learning anything, and Steve apologizes. Even Rhodey getting injured earlier is fixed at the end. In the moment, it feels like change, since hey, Steve and Tony aren't getting along. But like Smile and Stanley said, it's just the illusion of change. So if I could go back and rewrite some of these movies, Civil War should have ended with those Avengers still in prison. It's not like Hawkeye or Falcon appeared in any movies between that and Infinity War. And by the way, the Sokovia Accords? Shouldn't those have come up before Tony started shooting up the West Village? Anyway, Thanos' arrival should make Tony realize that he was wrong, that the Accords are preventing them from dealing with this. So he goes against the orders of the UN and frees the imprisoned Avengers. Boom. Suddenly, you've got actual consequences and growth and change. I guess I don't know what Marvel movies are all about. Isn't there anyone who can tell me what Marvel movies are all about? Sure, Patrick Willems. I can tell you what Marvel movies are all about. Lights, please. And there was in New York, Peter Parker, abiding in the science lab. And lo, the spider came upon him, and the radiation shone round about him, and Peter was afraid. And Uncle Ben said unto him, With great power there must also come great responsibility. For unto you is born this day in the city of New York a savior, who is Spider-Man. And he swung on webbed ropes, and there was a multitude of films, the best being the second one, the one with Dr. Octopus. And that's what Marvel movies are all about, Patrick Willems. I know it seems like I'm being really harsh on these movies, and the thing is, I like them. 
Check my Letterboxd account. I've given all but two MCU movies positive scores. And that's the thing. These movies are so fun and so good at characterization and filled with great moments and scenes that I always come out of them having had a great time. It took years for me to start to notice that something was feeling a little empty, that I wasn't as invested as I wanted to be or as I used to be. In the past 15 years, we've had dozens of superhero movies. We've had multiple superhero cinematic universes. We've had five movies featuring Peter Parker, and yet still, none of them have been as good as Sam Raimi's Spider-Man 2. Pizza time. This is a movie that I think the MCU should be learning some lessons from. It's a sequel, it continues an ongoing story, it has a similar balance of humor and drama to the MCU, but it does it all better. If the first Spider-Man movie is about Peter Parker learning that with great power comes great responsibility, then Spider-Man 2 is about exploring that responsibility and the consequences of it. It's about the toll that being a superhero takes on the rest of his life. For the whole movie, Peter faces consequence after consequence for being Spider-Man and trying to do the right thing. You're late. You're fired. You're fired. The grades have been steadily declining. All I got is this 20 to the rest of the week. No one will be seated after the doors are closed. He suffers academically, he loses his job, he lets down his best friend, and he loses the chance to be with the woman he loves. Also, the movie is full of amazing kinetic imaginative action scenes, it's shot beautifully, it's funny, it features J.K. Simmons as J. Jonah Jameson, but this is all in service of a story that is about the difficulties and consequences of having great responsibility. In the end, Peter and MJ finally get together, but the final shot of the movie is of Mary Jane realizing the consequences of the decision she just made and the dangerous road ahead for them. Spider-Man 2 is great because it's actually about something. We see Peter Parker struggle and suffer and grow, and all of that earns the huge final emotional payoff. It tells a complete story that's a part of an ongoing series, without sacrificing growth for the characters. Come on, Marvel. You could be doing this too. <sighs> I am in sad shape. One minute. Before you begin, I ask that you pay in advance. Five cents, please. Boy, what a sale! How I love to hear that old money plink! That beautiful sound of cold, hard cash! That beautiful, beautiful sound! Nickels, nickels, nickels! That beautiful sound of plinking nickels! <laughs> anyway, what seems to be the problem? I just can't figure these movies out. Why can't they have consequences? Why can't they grow? I think we'd better pinpoint their fears. If we can find out what they're afraid of, then we can label it. Is it a fear of consequences? That's pisanthrophobia. A fear of change? That's metathesiophobia. No, I don't think a movie studio has any phobias. Then what did you come to me for? I can't solve your problems for you. Good grief, Patrick Willems. Here's a question. Why do you watch this channel? Do you love the sound of my voice? Do you enjoy watching me make my friends dress up in silly costumes? Possibly. But what I hear from more people is that they like learning stuff. All I can really teach you about are movies, but if you want to learn about a wider range of topics from people who know way more than I do, you should check out Curiosity Stream, our sponsor for this episode. Curiosity Stream is a subscription streaming service dedicated to nonfiction, with over 2,000 documentaries to choose from. Like, they've got David Attenborough's Light on Earth, which is all about bioluminescent animals and was just nominated for an Emmy for Best Cinematography. You can get your first 30 days totally free if you sign up at curiositystream.com slash patrickhwillems and use the promo code patrickhwillems. That's my name. So as great as YouTube video essays are, why not go watch some real documentaries? Hey, welcome back and thanks for watching. This is obviously just the first installment of either two or three, we'll see. So before you comment and ask why I didn't cover something, well, wait for part two. I wish I could have fit it all into this one, but there's a lot to cover here. 
If you're not already aware, I co-host a podcast called The Infinity Podcast that is all about Marvel movies and how they connect to the rest of popular culture. So if you want way more of me talking about the MCU, you should check that out. It's on every podcast platform. New episodes drop every Monday morning. I also want to let you all know that we have our own subreddits now. There's a link in the description, so if you want to go hang out with other people who watch these videos and ask me questions, that's the place for it. And click on over to the Patreon if you want to help us keep making these videos and maybe make it possible for me to one day hire someone to help out so I can get a proper night's sleep. And I'm gonna take a nap now. Bye. Have you tried thumbs before? These things are great. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yo, cool. That's it. Back in school. You got it. Hanging around the water fountain.